My whole work is to teach people to step off that roller coaster and steady their glucose levels so they can get back to, you know, thriving physically and mentally. Let's start off by talking about how chronic blood sugar spikes can predispose us to gaining excessive body fat. Interesting that you would say predispose. So the way I see it is that, so glucose spikes are something that your body doesn't like and your body knows that those spikes are bad for you. So when those spikes happen, one of the ways your body protects you is by taking the extra glucose and storing it away in your muscle, in your liver, and in your fat cells. That's one of the ways we gain fat on our body. On top of that, the more spikes you have, the more you're gonna increase your cravings, your hunger, the more you're gonna be tired and reaching for some sugar for that dopamine hit, and the more your insulin levels are gonna be elevated over time. So we know from the studies that even if you're eating equal calories, just eating in a way that creates a lot of spikes will make fat gain more likely. Yeah. This is a perfect segue into discussion about insulin. Mm -hmm. You know, insulin can seem kind of like a bad word in some ways today, but also when we hear the word conventionally, people immediately think about diabetes. That's kind of like the popular narrative when you think about insulin, but it's so important for our survival it as is. a species. I love insulin. She's great. She just gets a bad rep when there's too much of her, you know? Like insulin at its core, if you don't have insulin, if your body doesn't have the ability to make insulin, you need to inject some, otherwise you will die. That's what happens if you have type one diabetes. So insulin is, you know, at its core, extremely protective, extremely helpful to protect your body against those glucose spikes. But over time, if insulin levels get too high themselves, then that leads to type 2 diabetes and other issues, you know, like fertility issues are very tightly linked. So it's a little bit like some of it is good, too much of a good thing is bad. And same thing for glucose, right? We need glucose. Your, our body loves using glucose for energy, but too much of it over time creates issues. And I love using the image of a plant. So you have some nice plants behind you. And if you gave me one of these to take care of while you went on vacation, I would know to give the plant some water to keep it alive. But if I gave the plant too much water, then it would drown and you'd be back and the plant would be dead. So a little bit is good, too much causes problems. Yeah, that's a perfect analogy. Mm -hmm. We have a snake plant, by the way, for those who don't see the video version. And these are great because they're kind of nocturnal. They do a lot of activity when the lights are off. What kind of activity? like producing, you know, that kind of trans translation or conversion, you know, oxygen and carbon oh, yeah. dioxide, carbon oxygen. converting it for us, kind of cleaning the air in a sense. And you know what, how they do that? The, I mean, plants create glucose. Photosynthesis is the creation of glucose molecules. And all the plants around us are fully made out of glucose that they then transform into other types of substances. But glucose is really the core of life and Amazing. plants make it. Amazing, amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to dig more into this conversation about insulin. And actually, in the book, you detail, and it's another good analogy, the glucose roller coaster, mm -hmm. right? So what's happening, actually, when we eat a food? Let's mm -hmm. just say, you know, we eat a banana, for example. Mm -hmm. What's happening with when we're eating that food, the, our blood sugar, and how is that affecting insulin and kind of this glucose roller coaster? Yeah, so if I may, I think I'm going to use a food that would create a bigger spike than a banana, like maybe some orange juice and some granola. Oh, that wow. would be a bigger Carb spike. Heavy, baby. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay. just to go to the extreme, so we see what's going on. So when you eat starches or sugars, so starches being, you know, bread, pasta, rice, potatoes, cereal, grains, or sugars, anything sweet, from, from fruit juice to chocolate cake to a banana, those foods turn to glucose as you digest them. And so those glucose molecules make their way into your bloodstream and the concentration of glucose in your blood starts increasing. And the faster it increases, the more it increases, the bigger the glucose spike that happens after that meal. And so when a glucose spike takes place, there's a few bad consequences in the body. Number one, it increases inflammation. Number two, it increases aging. And number three, what happens is that your body produces insulin, sends out insulin from your pancreas to store away that extra glucose. To clean it up out of our... Essentially, cholesterol. yes, to protect you. Because if glucose stays too high for too long, a lot of damage starts happening to your cells. So your body, with this very important insulin, grabs the extra glucose and stores it away. And that's the relationship. Insulin is released in response to these glucose spikes. Mm. 
Yeah, it's like, it's so incredible, the intelligence of I the know. body. But over time, doing that again and again, this kind of chronic yeah. glucose spikes and crashes. Oh yeah, and so let's talk about the crash. So when insulin puts glucose away, then your glucose levels start going down, right? And so they decrease. And if they decrease too quickly, sometimes because your body is just sending out too much insulin, then you experience a crash below baseline. This increases cravings, hunger, fatigue, all sorts of symptoms that many of us think are just normal, right? We just think it's normal to crave something sweet two hours after a meal. We think it's normal to be tired at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. That can often just be the result of a glucose crash happening because your previous meal led to a spike, therefore a crash. And so I like taking the image of people being a high functioning glucose roller coaster. So a lot of people, they go spike, drop, spike, drop, spike, drop all day. And they manage these symptoms with caffeine, with eating sugar to sort of like combat the fatigue and the hunger they're feeling. But overall, they're really victims to that roller coaster. And on the inside, the longer the roller coaster goes on for, the more damaged your mitochondria become. Your mitochondria are the things responsible for making energy in your body. And so that can lead to chronic fatigue, uh, you know, among many other symptoms. And so my whole work is to teach people to step off that roller coaster and steady their glucose levels so they can get back to, you know, thriving physically and mentally. With insulin being active, we're essentially having this signal of energy storage. And so we're definitely not burning fat at this point. Yeah, when there's insulin, insulin around, active. your fat cells become one way. So stuff can get in, but nothing can come out. So when there's a lot of insulin around, it's like your body's like, okay, we're in storage mode. We're not in fat burning mode, we're in fat storage mode. Yeah. Now, there's a couple of things to unpack here in this glucose body fat equation. So you already mentioned the impact we have with insulin. You said this in passing, you said inflammation. And inflammation is a huge kind of goes hand in hand with being overweight and obese. And a lot of people aren't talking about it. So how does blood glucose or these chronic spikes mm -hmm. impact inflammation? There's two mechanisms. So the first one is that when a lot of glucose arrives in your cells, it goes to your mitochondria because that's where it's supposed to be transformed into energy. So glucose goes straight there. Unfortunately, when a glucose spike happens and you're delivering too much glucose to your mitochondria, your mitochondria just kind of shut down. They go like, whoa, too much glucose, cannot deal. And they just like stress out and they're like, no, cannot. And when they are in that state of stress, they produce what's called reactive oxygen species, which are very small molecules that have very damaging consequences. They can snap your DNA, they can poke holes in the membranes of your cells, and they can damage a cell so much that the cell becomes what's called under a state of oxidative stress, which just means the cell is damaged. And when that happens, that leads to inflammation in the body. So that's the first pathway. And you mentioned it, like inflammation is so key. Um, the World Health Organization says that three out of five people today will die of an inflammation-based disease three out of five people. The second pathway is that, well, actually there are three, but the second pathway is that the more glucose is, ha is in your body, the faster glycation is happening. Glycation is the process of aging. It's also similar to the process of cooking. Like when you put a chicken in the oven and it goes from pink to brown, it's being glycated. And the human body slowly glycates from the moment you're born. And then when you're fully glycated or fully cooked, you die, okay? That's aging. The more spikes you have, the faster that process happens. And that process also increases inflammation in the body. And then finally, insulin itself is inflammatory when there's too much of it. So you end up in a state of chronic inflammation, which just has so many damaging consequences to the body. And if you look at like Alzheimer's, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, whatever, like acne, eczema, psoriasis, like all diseases, all chronic diseases usually have an inflammatory base. And so the higher inflammation is happening in your body, the more likely you will develop it and the worse they will get if you already have them. This is bananas. Mm -hmm. Literally, literally <laughs> going back to, you know, really being empowered and, and understanding what's happening in our bodies is so, so important. 
And so we've got the impact on insulin, we've got the inflammation equation, mm -hmm. and also even our fat cells just dealing with all of that excess glucose. And as they're growing in, a little not so fun fact, our fat cells can actually expand like a thousand times their volume and, and hold quite a bit of content. It's kind of this protective thing with the intelligence of the body. But as they do so, they start to send out this false distress signal essentially, which is inflammation and the immune system is gonna be in a tizzy and we're putting ourselves into the state where we're kind of pre-inflamed already. And so then we add into the mix, you know, uh, an infection of some sort or, you know, heart psychological disease. Stress. Psychological stress. Psychological right? stress, yeah. Um, for females, like for example, you know, fasting too long, too often, doing high intensity exercise that's too intense too often, that can also become a stressor on the body. And so you're adding all these different kinds of stress, you know, you're doing fasting, cold plunge, sauna, high intensity interval exercise, you have inflammation going on, you have a stressful job, you know, your kids are stressing you out and you're just like, your whole organism just becomes this ball of stress and inflammation. Um, and that's the root cause of a lot of issues. Yeah, oh my goodness. So the last component in this kind of weight gain, fat gain equation I want to talk about, and you said this in passing as well, is the craving yeah, aspect. Yeah, this is fascinating. And you shared this in the book. In 2011, a research team from Yale University uncovered new insights about cravings by placing people into an fMRI scanner. Talk about that. Oh yeah, I love this study. It's one of my favorite ones. Shout out to these amazing scientists that we learned so much about. So, uh, so learned so much from. So the scientists took participants and they put them in an fMRI scanner. And while the people were in the scanner, they one, were measuring their glucose levels, and two, they were showing the participants photos of, you know, quote unquote, high calorie foods that people often crave, like burgers, chips, cookies. And they were asking the participants to rate how much they wanted to eat the food. So how much they were feeling a craving for that food. <laughs> so amazing. And the scientists were also looking at images of the brain scan going on. This is what they find. They found when the people's glucose levels were normal, steady, they didn't really rate any of the foods highly. They were just like meh burger, meh salad, meh cookie, meh. However, when their glucose levels were low, which can happen after a spike, remember spike crash, then all of a sudden the participants were rating the cookies and the burgers much higher on that scale. And the scientists saw that the part of their brain that is in charge of cravings started activating. So that low glucose levels was activating the biological response of craving. And so that's what can happen when you are on this glucose roller coaster. You feel these strong cravings for sweet foods. And if you're feeling that, trying to resist them with your willpower, like you're gonna lose, don't even try. Your body's ancestral programming is telling you from really deep inside your brain to go and find something that has a lot of calories in it. So the solution is not like to feel guilty or ashamed about this or to try to fight against it. It's more fixing the root cause so that naturally they go away. And sometimes, you know, I mean, now I never have anything in the morning that creates a glucose spike, but sometimes rarely, I don't know why, but I'll just want to eat something sweet in the morning. And then inevitably my whole day is this big roller coaster and I feel cravings all day. And, you know, it's just so amazing to experience that. It's just like clockwork. You eat something that creates a spike in the morning for breakfast, bam, two hours later, you want a cookie, bam, two hours later, you want like pasta or a burger. It's just, it's the programming in your brain. Yeah, it's so fascinating. We don't realize that we're doing it or that this is happening. Exactly. And pitting our willpower against our biology is, it's grounds for absolute destruction eventually. Yes. Like your will, your willpower is finite. And that's, this is also, we get into that feedback loop of learned helplessness in a sense and also guilt and shame and all these different things instead of stacking conditions in our favor. So this is great because I want to talk to you about this. Why is it that our culture today, you know, in kind of modern culture, especially in the Western world, why do we start our days off eating things that are so high in sugar to start the day? And what should we do instead? instead. And you actually talk about this in the book. Well, you know, this was an invention. Like we didn't used to eat this way. We used to eat for breakfast, whatever we ate for lunch or for dinner, you know, like, I don't know, some meat and potatoes. The fact that we're now eating dessert for breakfast 
is an invention of the food industry. So, but now it's become so commonplace. People believe that, oh, in order to have energy, I need to eat sugar in the morning. Such amazing marketing campaigns around this, right? Like on all the cereal boxes and all the fruit juices, we've been told over and over again that sugar is good for you because it's going to give you energy. But, but actually, they say carbohydrates. Yes, carbohydrates, right? So like starches and sugars, you're totally right. Anything, but generally when it's sweet, it means there's sugar in it, right? So I, I make a little shortcut, but you're right. Actually, what's going on when you eat carbs in the morning, if you just have carbs for breakfast, you're getting dopamine in the brain, which is a pleasure molecule, which might make you feel a little bit like perked up. And you might confuse that for energy, but it's not energy. It's dopamine. On the inside, your mitochondria, which are in charge of making the energy, they're stressing out. And so over time, as you keep doing this, chronic fatigue sets in, even though you're eating carbs in the morning thinking that that's good for your energy levels. So anyway, so my very first most important hack that I teach people is to switch from having a breakfast that is just carbs to having what I call a savory breakfast, which is a breakfast built around protein. It's very, very important. So the components of a savory breakfast that keeps your glucose levels steady, unlocks energy, reduces cravings, helps you feel better, helps reduce inflammation too, is as follows. Number one, build it around protein. Number two, add some healthy fat. Number three, if you can, add some fiber, although in the morning it's not usually very easy for people to add fiber. And then you can eat some starches for taste, like you can have like a slice of bread or whatever, or potatoes for taste. And if you want to eat anything sweet, it can only be whole fruit. No jam, no juice, no cereal, no granola, no muesli, no nothing sweet except if you really want a sweet taste, some whole fruit. And if you do that, and in the book I have a bunch of recipes to help people actually get started, you will unlock a new experience of your days. Instead of kicking off that roller coaster first thing in the morning, you will actually get a lot of power back, a lot of connection to your body, your body will thrive, and it will really change your experience of your days. And I know this for a fact. I grew up eating a Nutella crepe and orange juice every morning. So big glucose spike. And I thought it was normal that at 11, I was exhausted. I was so hungry. My stomach hurt. You know, I had no idea. Uh, but now I know. I was just, it was just a big glucose spike. Yeah. And again, this is the, the norm here. I remember when I was in elementary school, I, had the, I was on the free lunch program. So we get this little red ticket. And I remember being in line. I was pumped because, you know, we didn't generally have breakfast stuff at my house. And... Every day, the main option would be cereal, frosted flakes, and a single serve bowl. And then, you know, milk also, milk sugar. Mm -hmm. It's another form of sugar that we're delivering. So it's just all carbohydrates and a little bit of protein and fat sprinkled in. And that or French toast sticks or Man. donuts. Sometimes we get these two glazed donuts in a little package as well. Like th this was the school lunch program, school breakfast program. Even like string cheese fed. would have been so much better. You know, yeah. and again, you know, if we take a look at some of the results since that time, you know, when I was in elementary school, childhood obesity has tripled in this country. It is insane. And, you know, instead of addressing the root cause, like what's what's alter, altering? Because even when we talk about gaining weight or becoming obese, our bodies are just adapting to the conditions that we're Listen, exposing. Your body is trying to protect you like your body is yeah. not doing that to be mean. Your yeah. body's just responding to what's going on. And in fact, putting on fat is, as you mentioned, a protective mechanism against these elevated glucose levels. And if genetically you're not able to grow the number and the size of your fat cells, you're protected for far less time against type 2 diabetes, right? So, I mean, it's complicated, right? The relationship to fat is complicated, but at its core, remember, your body is not fighting you if it's putting on fat. It's just responding to what's going on. Absolutely, absolutely. And also, you know, to today in our culture, you know, there's things like Ozempic and there's mm -hmm. these new, it's being added to the standard of care, even to treat children who are struggling with their weight. And again, not addressing the root cause. Dude, it's wild. It's just like a pharma band-aid on top of this really broken food system. And I just hope things change and that we actually go back to eating in a way that's more normal. But you know this, that would remove a lot of profits, you a know, profiting profits. from people's 
ignorance and pain yes. and their struggles, yes. essentially, you know, with th there's a farming of sick people happening. And having this included in the school lunch program, for example, is just already setting me up on a path towards degeneration and Absolutely. disease, which I experienced, you know, in my teens. My bones were so brittle. I was at track practice and I broke my hip Stop. at track practice. Yes, Stop. yes, yes. Shoo. And so eventually I get diagnosed degenerative bone disease, degenerative disc disease. My proclivity, as you just mentioned, to frame obesity as something genetic, which again, and we'll put a study up for everybody to see, very rarely are genes found to be causative of actual problems. They're correlated, but we, we're in this field now, epigenetics is, the leading science. Listen, I worked in genetics for five years. I can tell you that your DNA does not predict what disease you get. It might increase your likelihood by a few percentage points, but it's not at all the major determinants. Like when people say, oh, diabetes just runs in my family, so I'm going to get it. What they don't realize is that actually it's not the DNA causing it. It's the habits that they're inheriting that's causing it. See, and this is leading right into my point, which is my, my family. So I have a different father than my little brother and sister. And there is going to be a genetic milieu that I'm getting that's slightly different, whereas they have more of a proclivity outwardly towards the development of obesity. Like you just said, there's kind of an insulation of protection against the development of type 2 diabetes. But some other kind of disease program is going to set in. Yeah. And we're just labeling it as a disease. So my thing was degeneration, you know, like arthritic condition of my mm -hmm. spine and my bones. It's inflammatory based too, right? Exactly. In inflammation is going to be tied into all of this stuff, you know, and so it's just going to depend on how your body's going to manifest in its dealing with is trying to adapt and create an alternative way of functioning under unideal circumstances. Yeah, fundamentally, your body just wants to keep you alive. And that I think that's something that we, we just know that's for sure, right? Then the issue becomes can you break free from all the things around you that are making your body sick in the first place? Can you break free from all the marketing, all the unhealthy food landscape and stuff? It's hard, you know, because most people, I think most people want to feel good and they're just listening to the marketing messages or they can't afford the healthy vegetables. You know, it's just like the environment is set up in such a way that it is really challenging and sometimes feels overwhelming. Like a doctor might say, eat better, exercise more, which is very vague, vague advice. And so my work is I'm trying to fix that first step, that motivation gap, right? I'm trying to give people really easy, attainable, tiny little goals with big impacts on your health that you can start today. That's really what motivates me the most is like getting people to that first step. Yeah, you just said something. You just drop in little profound nuggets in here, mm -hmm. but you said something that most people unfortunately, are not really educated about, in particular, when we're talking about healthcare practitioners who have so much influence, you said that most people want to feel good. Yeah. But in our field, we condition ourselves to think that people won't listen. They're just going to do this thing. They want to suffer. They're going to create disease. So I'm just going to try to save their life with this medication. Dude, that's insane. I haven't met one person who doesn't want to feel good or be healthy. Yeah. They might have a story as to why it's not likely for them or why it's hard or whatever the case might yeah. be. But if they had a choice, they would be disease free. They would feel good in their bodies. Of course. But the issue is like the advice they get is vague and a little bit unhelpful or feels just too overwhelming. They feel like they have to change their entire life, you know, yeah. which is not the case. You can do small things, but phew, it's a jungle out there. It's really difficult for people who are suffering to find a way to change. Um, I mean, yeah, it's it's a. It's, it's what I'm doing, what That's I'm exactly, trying to do. Exactly yeah. what you're doing. Like you're giving these small, simple things yes. to just add into the mix. And one of the things I really love about your work is you're telling people like, listen, I like pasta. Dude, I love pasta. I love pasta and chocolate, like pasta, chocolate and cats. Those are my favorite, <laughs> not to eat the cats. Okay, but, just you know. for clarification. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No, I listen. Yes. You know, of course, it would be better for our body if we totally cut out anything sweet. Right. Sugar is literally just for pleasure. But I want to eat it like I want the triple chocolate cake fudge thing with the cookies and the chocolate syrup on top. Like I love that. Shit. You know, I love it. So when I discovered that the glucose spikes that I was experiencing were har harming my health and specifically my mental health, I had to find a solution because I didn't want the spikes. I wanted to feel better, but I didn't want to give up the cake and the pasta. So that's really how my work crystallized. It was like, let me find in the science some tips 
that allow me to eat the carbs with less of an impact on my glucose levels. Uh, and I think that's why it's resonating so much because I'm not telling people to cut out anything. It's like, I'm going to teach you how to eat the chocolate cake in a way that doesn't create the glucose roller coaster. As a result, in a way that doesn't increase sugar addiction or make you have more cravings, right? I want people to be in a state of like maximal pleasure, minimal impact on your health. Yeah, yeah. And so with that said, obviously, with your new book, you're providing a variety, a vast array of wonderful recipes. And in those times when you want to have something that might historically derange your glucose, you're providing these very simple hacks mm -hmm. that, funny enough, like a lot of this stuff has been done for thousands of years. Exactly. Let's talk about one that is just popping on the streets right now, which is utilizing vinegar. Yeah. So in, in the new book, I have this sort of, so in my first book, I shared 10 hacks, right? And then people were like, okay, I want a more step-by-step -step, like plan to get started. So the second book, The Glucose Goddess Method is you introduce one hack per week for four weeks. And then you're sort of taking the on-ramp, the fast track to steady glucose. So week one is savory breakfast, as we talked about. And week two is vinegar. So the science is really interesting. Vinegar, it turns out, if you have a tablespoon of it in some water before a meal, you can reduce the glucose spike of that meal by up to 30%. And the insulin release by up to 20%, you can reduce it without changing what you're eating afterwards, just by harnessing the power of this molecule called acetic acid, which is in vinegar, that has a powerful effect on your glucose levels. And so in week two, I give people lots of different ways to try out this hack for themselves. You know, it doesn't have to be just vinegar and water. Most people find that not very appealing. I love it now, but you know, to each their own. And you can have it as tea, you can make little mocktails, you can use it as a dressing on your food. And just by adding, this very small little ingredient, you can have a powerful effect on your health. And interestingly, vinegar has been used for centuries in countries like in Iran, where they just know it's a healthy thing to add. In the 18th century, vinegar tea was prescribed to people with type 1 diabetes. Mm. So wow. culturally, we've known these things. For example, the breakfast. We've known that breakfast should not be dessert. Like we've known breakfast should be a regular meal. But now we've lost touch with a lot of this stuff. And now because we have the science to show us how it actually works in our body, we can decide to bring those things back and they're really, really powerful. Now, when you say acetic acid, it immediately makes me think about apple cider vinegar. Mm -hmm. So is that one of the vinegar choices? So any type of vinegar works, any type. White wine vinegar, red vinegar, balsamic, rice vinegar, cherry vinegar, whatever, and apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar or ACV is the the most popular one, but it, they all work the same. For a lot of people, ACV is just more palatable. They like the taste more, uh, but you can use any vinegar you want, except avoid the very syrupy balsamic glaze, which is really not vinegar anymore. It's more like sugar with yeah. a bit of vinegar in it. So as long as you're not using that, you can use whatever you want. Okay, perfect, perfect. Now to go back, there was something that jumped out. It stuck with me since you mentioned it in this process of aging, right? Mm. And essentially we're slow cooking. Totally. Thanks to your dictation Glycation. about this. You know, we're- Isn't we're, that wild though? Yeah, it is. Yeah. You know, Benjamin Button though. You know, know. he was revert, you never mind. All right, now with this said, I wanna talk more about this aging process. Yeah. Uh, you talked about glycation and one of the kind of outward things when we talk about aging is the health of our skin. Mm -hmm. And you specifically talk about that too. Yes. So how does, and I don't think we think about this at all, yeah. how does chronic glucose spikes and being on that glucose roller coaster affect our skin health? Well, two things. Number one, the more glucose spikes you have, the more wrinkles you get. Because that glycation that takes place when there's a lot of glucose spikes happening also affects your collagen. When a molecule of collagen becomes glycated, it becomes brittle and broken and less flexible, and that leads to wrinkles. So if that's the biggest motivator you take away, for a lot of people it is, with fewer glucose spikes, aging slows down, wrinkles slow down. Now, another clear correlation between glucose spike and skin is in these inf inflammation-based skin problems like acne, psoriasis, eczema, these things are inflammation-based. So the more inflammation is happening in your body, 
the more symptoms of acne, psoriasis, eczema you're going to get. So if you suffer from any of these conditions, getting inflammation down is really key to you know, put it in remission. So your skin is really a good messenger for what's going on on the inside. Yeah, we really, you know, I, I kind of had an insight many years ago when studying how we're developing, you know, in the womb, when the egg is fertilized, like what's happening first? Like what are the mm -hmm. kind of the most important foundational things getting laid down? And obviously the nervous system and our skin is developing in a certain way as well. It's kind of, again, it's this interactive force with the outside and, and internal world, right? So our skin is kind of the outermost portion of our nervous system in Ooh, a sense. Yeah. And so when you talked earlier about stress and inflammation, I was immediately like I was tying in this skin equation, like stress really does show up on our skin. Yeah. And one of the most stressful things we're doing every day in our culture is going on this glucose roller coaster. Yeah. And we don't realize it, you know, when we're looking at and, you know, we see the commercials take proactive or, you know, <laughs> whatever. It's just again, it's not addressing the root cause. Yeah, you can put stuff on your skin um, and that can help to some extent, like having, you know, a good skincare routine is important. But really fixing the inside is going to be the most powerful thing you can do. Yeah, it's inside and outside. So we're yeah, both directions reflection. when it comes to our skin, mm -hmm. for sure. So in the book, you actually, I'm going to share a direct quote in your discussion about acne and rosacea, etc. You stated, quote, in a study in males aged 15 to 25, the diet that resulted in the flattest glucose curves led to a significant reduction in acne, unquote. Yeah. So we've got some peer-reviewed data on this. Yeah. And again, it just might make sense when we start to unpack what's happening inside our bodies when we're throwing in these particular foods without your intelligent hacks as well mm -hmm. that are just sending us on this glucose roller coaster every day. Totally. And I wish I knew this in high school, you know? Like, I was like, oh, my skin's so bad. How can I make it better? So I was doing all these, like, masks and creams. And I was like, ah! But had I known that the Nutella crepes were contributing, it would have been a different story. Now, you mentioned earlier one of your motivations mm -hmm. was how this was affecting your mental health. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? So when I was 19, I had an accident that really changed my life and the, the course of my life in a way. I broke my back jumping off a waterfall. So don't let your kids jump off waterfalls. What? Yeah. Wait, Wait a minute. I just need a moment. Yeah. That is crazy. Yeah. What? Mm -hmm. Okay, continue, continue. It was crazy. Total freak accident. Two of my friends had jumped off before they were fine. And just hitting the water a little bit at a wrong angle on my tailbone, just one of my vertebrae exploded. So I had super intense surgery. I have a lot of metal in my spine now. Um, was really scared for my life. Was in so much physical pain you can't even imagine. But then in a few months, like my physical health actually healed pretty well. You know, I started working out and making sure my core was strong and I was okay. But my mental health completely changed. I started getting a lot of these weird episodes of what I call depersonalization, which is the feeling of being a stranger in your own body. So I would look at my hands and be like, that's not mine. Or I would look in the mirror and have a panic attack because I was like, who is that person? Just like complete the opposite of embodiment, right? I was just completely afraid of being alive and being in this body. It was really horrible. Um, and lay on to that some anxiety, some depression. I could never be alone. I mean, the whole thing got super, super, super dark. And so I went on a journey to try to figure out how my body worked because at that point in time, it was like a black box that I didn't understand. And I needed to get better. Like, otherwise, life was too difficult, you know? So I, I just was like, okay, I need to figure some stuff out. So that's why I switched from... At the end of my mathematics degree, I then switched to biochemistry in grad school. So I was like, okay, let me understand the cell. Let me understand the body. And that's also why I went to the field of genetics to try to figure out, does my DNA really affect my health? It doesn't. It doesn't. And while I was in the DNA world, that's when I came across glucose. And I started discovering that I was experiencing these glucose spikes, even though I don't have diabetes. And that the days where I had the most spikes were the days my mental health was the worst. And I started seeing this correlation between steady glucose levels and feeling so much better. 
And at the moment, it was because I was testing a continuous glucose monitor that I was able to see this. And so I dove into the science and I was like, damn, wow. Like most people who don't have diabetes actually have these spikes. It was brand new science that had just come out. Um, and then that's when I had that realization of, okay, I don't want the spikes. I want my mental health to improve, but I don't want to give up the chocolate and the pasta. And so that's what led me down this path. And once I had fixed my glucose levels, I felt like, I had a foundation. I felt more connected to myself. I felt more empowered. I was like, okay, I've, I've been able to actually help my brain. So then on top of that, I started layering, you know, EMDR, craniosacral therapy, emotional processing, like all this stuff. And I got to a point where I actually healed, but it took, you know, over 10 years. And so now I just want to give people the fast track to getting that base layer of steady glucose done. Because if you don't have that, it's going to be really hard to heal anything that's going on for most of us healing that heals a lot a lot of things or everything it's the place you need to start oh man thank you for sharing that yeah. that is a wild story it started off i'm so glad it's over man yeah. like, i'm so glad i'm on the other side wow Whew. that's the thing too it's just like you've overcome such a tremendous obstacle Dude. and you did it yeah. right but when we're healed, it's just like, I can't believe I did that. Like, and of course I, I would believe. never want to do that. Or, you know, if I had to do it over, I wouldn't even choose to do that. No. But when you're in it and you have the audacity to decide, like, I'm just going to keep moving forward. I'm going to find a way. I'm going to figure this out. Yeah, But to be honest, like when, I, when you're in such a dark place, you feel like this is going to be your life forever. Like it's really hard. If anybody listening is in a dark place right now, just remember your brain is tricking you into thinking this is going to be like this forever. It's not. You know, know that it will change. It will get better. This is not how you're going to be forever. Because that's how I felt. And now I'm on the other side of things. But uh, yeah, super awful, dark stuff. Now, the relationship here with our mental health and our diet is finally gaining some traction, right? And one of the simple on-ramps to understanding this is that you know, our minds, you know, our brains are not separate from the rest of our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, they're going to affect our perspective. Of course, they're going to affect how our brains are working. And we're going to put up a study on the screen, even with schizophrenia. There's several peer-reviewed studies on how gluten exacerbates schizophrenic episodes, for what? example. Yeah, I mean, there isn't really a, a disorder or a mental health disease, right? This Again, but we're putting labels on these things, which are just the bodies adapting mm -hmm. to unideal circumstances and just kind of changing the way that it's operating. But right now there isn't a disease that isn't linked to diet in some kind of way because scientists finally are asking the questions and looking into it. And we keep, we open up the hood and we find, oh, it sure does, you know. We you had, know 20 um, years ago, like when you said, oh, your diet is linked to cancer risk, people were laughing. Like, yeah. <laughs> even with type two diabetes yeah, of all I things, know. you know, it wasn't even considered to be something that was curable yeah. for a phase. But also there was a time when it was known as adult onset diabetes. Yep. They and changed the name. Five year olds get it. Yeah. yeah, it's insanity, you know. So with that being said, right now, this is also your work is, it's, I think it's also a pleasant surprise or pleasant side effect. Like people might be employing these things to lose weight or to improve their body composition, but they find out that their mental health is better. Exactly. And actually, I think most people come at this. I really don't promote this as a way to lose weight because I think there's so much unhealthy just stuff around weight loss. I tell people this is not a diet. Okay, the objective is not weight loss. If you want to study your glucose levels, it's because you want to feel good. You want to get more energy, cut your cravings, sleep better, improve your fertility, your skin, slow down aging, reverse your diabetes. Like that's what you're here for. It's for health. Now, often a consequence of steady glucose levels is weight loss and fat loss specifically. But I want to teach people that it is a welcome consequence. It's not the primary objective, right? Because if your only focus is losing weight, you might go into really unhealthy territory. And one person can have a very small body, but be very unhealthy on the inside, right? So I just want people to focus a bit more on like, actually, they want to feel good. You want to feel good, you want to feel happy, you want to improve your mental health, your energy. And as a consequence, the fat loss does happen. Yeah, yeah, I love that. That's the thing too, is just, I've been on a mission to help to reframe these things mm. because also the weight loss piece 
it puts it into it's like a silo or like a little pithy box and if you don't achieve that thing this is like oh f it right you just throw the whole thing away mm -hmm. when we start stacking like adding more legs under that belief about how diet affects our lives all of a sudden it's just like oh this is one of the most important decisions that i make exactly with what i'm putting at the end of my fork mm -hmm. and now i want to loop this back to our mind and how we are perceiving reality one of the most common side effects of chronic glucose spikes and crashes is how it affects our personality <laughs> and also how we interact with other people yeah. let's talk about that um, and another incredible study so these scientists took married couples and they gave each person in the couple a voodoo doll and they told them every time your partner irritates you put a pin in this voodoo doll after a few weeks the scientists got the dolls back and they also measured the participants glucose levels and they found that the people who had the most irregular up and down and high and low glucose levels, they, they had stuck the most pins in the voodoo dolls representing their partner. All this to say that your glucose levels can affect how irritated you are about the people around you, can affect how nice you are to those around you. And that's just like one part of how glucose affects your brain. The more spikes you have, the more brain fog you have the more symptoms of anxiety and depression you have. So essentially, if you are on a glucose roller coaster, you may think you're a certain way. You may think you're a person who gets angry, who's irritated, who's just like short tempered, who's hungry all the time, who doesn't sleep well, who has acne, etc. Actually, these may just be the symptoms of the glucose roller coaster happening within. So just in an effort to figure out who you really are, hmm. <laughs> studying the, those glucose levels can be a great help. Yeah, what if your hangry version of yourself was like yourself that the world sees all the time? We think that everybody was an asshole, mm -hmm. you know? It's just understanding again what's happening in our bodies. It's just part of that, and if you could unpack this a little bit, there's a sense of emergency response. When our blood sugar crashes yes. like that, that's going to release catecholamines in our body, stress chemicals as well, to kind of help to get that rebalanced. Absolutely, so low glucose levels is a state of stress for the body. So if you're spiking and then you're dropping really low, your body responds to that low by releasing stress hormones in the bloodstream. And what this does is it tells your liver to pump out glucose really quickly to get that level back up. But you as a human, you're experiencing that stress. It can be nausea, it can be anxiety, it can just be shaking, sweats, like there are a lot of symptoms connected to that. And then in and of itself, a glucose roller coaster is a chronic stressor on the body, which can affect your thyroid, your adrenals, etc. And so if you layer onto that other stressors, as we mentioned, like fasting for too long, if you're a female, having a stressful job, doing a lot of high intensity exercise, like all these things, you can put your body in a state of chronic stress without even knowing you're doing it. And that state of chronic stress can lead to, you know, fertility problems, mental health problems, inability to lose fat on the body because your body is just like so stressed out. Um, yeah, it's quite remarkable. Now, in your first book, you covered 10 of these science backed hacks. And in this new book, so this is the glucose goddess method, you're doubling down and actually helping people walking them through how to employ four specific ones. We already talked a little bit about the savory breakfast, the vinegar hack. Can we talk a little bit about the other two and the next one being veggies first? Absolutely. So in week three of this method, we start having a veggie starter at the beginning of one of our meals. So most people do it before lunch or dinner. Some people before breakfast, although in the morning I have a hard time with vegetables. So why do we do this? Why do we add this plate of vegetables to the beginning of our meals? Well, because vegetables contain a magical ingredient called, Sean, what's it called? It's an F word, isn't it? Yes, it's called fiber. So fiber is really amazing. And when you have fiber at the beginning of the meal, fiber has time to go to your upper intestine and deploy itself onto the walls of that intestine, forming a protective mesh. So the intestinal wall becomes less porous, okay? And as a result, any glucose molecules coming down after the meal will make their way more slowly into the bloodstream. So reducing the spike they create. And very importantly, in this four week method that I designed, you don't have to cut out any foods. Nothing is off limits. You don't have to stop eating carbs. We're just adding these four hacks in. And the rest of the time we do whatever 
we want and we still get fabulous results. And I think that's one of the reasons this has been so popular is because nowhere will I tell you never eat chocolate cake again. It's like, no, 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 eat whatever you want, but add these hacks like gentle giants in your life so they protect you and you can still eat what you love but have some benefits on your health too. Mm. Immediately, I'm thinking just logically with fiber and how fiber in, in nature and the common foods that we have, fiber is going to tend to come along with foods that are going to be higher in carbohydrates and or naturally occurring sugars. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting how those come packaged together? But to in try. processed foods, yeah, all the fiber is gone. Yeah. Oh, it's making sense. <laughs> it's making sense. It's devoid of that. Protective substance. Yep, exactly. So interesting. All right. So what is a veggie starter look like? If we're going out, let's just say you didn't have to run to the airport after mm -hmm. this and we're going out, we're having lunch. Mm -hmm. All right. What does a veggie starter look like? Well, at the restaurant, you can order any side you want. You know, a lot of restaurants have like a, you can order like a side of spinach or a side of beans or a side of roasted broccoli or whatever. Asparagus. Asparagus. Yes. It's asparagus season. Any of these vegetables, if you have it at the beginning of your meal, that counts as your veggie starter. And I also teach people like, okay, if you're not at home and you're not cooking these easy recipes, how to do this hack while you're out and about. Of course, it's really important. So m I would say my favorite veggie starter, if I were at a restaurant, would probably be like roasted something. If they had like some roasted broccoli, roasted Brussels sprouts, I like that a lot. But you can just have a side salad. And if you want to do two hacks in one, you put some vinegar on that. Mm. Therefore, you have the veggie starter hack plus the vinegar hack. And that's been done culturally exactly. for a long time. Right. So in France, we have this concept of crudité, which means raw veggies that you're supposed to eat at the beginning of a meal. And this has just been done for a super, super, super long time. And now I'm like, oh, wow, there's actually wisdom in all these cultural traditions, but we don't really do those anymore. You know, we've been so globalized that we don't really do that stuff anymore, wow. but we should bring it back because now we know that fiber is helping our glucose levels. Crudité at the La Plage. Oh, yes. Crudité <laughs> à la plage. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so I'm showing off my uh, French. You're too. pretty good, actually. Oh, thank at you. French, yes. Look at, come on, that it's hit true, my heart. It's true, it's thank true. you. Yeah. All right, thank you. You have to come visit. Now, this is a little fun fact. I've never talked about this before. Oh, spicy. So, <laughs> whenever, not every time, but the majority of the time when I'm having a meal, like my wife, maybe she, you know, whips up some things or I make a plate of food. We'll just say if it's, you know, an, you know, an omelet and maybe there's some kind of a starchy thing there and then some sauteed spinach. My, and this is before we've ever met or have, again, I've never talked about this. I'll go right for the, the veggies first. Really? The sauteed veggies. But I'm doing this out of a palate thing, right? Because I know that this vegetable isn't going to taste as good after I have the thing that you know, is more, Okay, you're saving right? the best for last. You're yeah, the so I think it's last. just like, I have this thing that I've trained myself to do, this mm -hmm. little delayed gratification, yeah. but it's also, it's just in a moment, we think things are so serious. And it's just like, I gotta, my wife is very different. She's going right for the thing that she wants, <laughs> all right? And then the other stuff will be like a, a side piece, essentially, you know, and that's fine. That's a way to go about it. But I've just kind of, because I want to enjoy that veggie as well, and I know it's going to taste the best when I'm hungriest. So that's why I eat that first. Oh, smart. I see what you mean. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's super cool that intuitively or through whatever past programming going on here that you're doing that, right? Because your body is going to be thanking you. So that's really awesome. I hear a few people have this um, habit. I definitely didn't. I was like, pasta first, baby. Yeah, see, <laughs> you and my wife get along perfectly. <laughs> but now, now what I do is I try to make my veggie starter like actually good. So I actually enjoy yeah, it. That's the thing too, of course. Like, right. That's the secret with when it comes to, to any secret. kind of vegetables and things like that. It's just like a Brussels sprout, me growing up as a kid and yeah. seeing a Brussels sprout or even having the having being forced to eat oh, one man, like boiled oh, and gross it's, it's ridiculous can i but tell you one of my favorite recipes of the veggie starters in the book absolutely it's called backwards broccoli okay it takes five minutes to make it's super cool so you take a, a head of broccoli and you chop it really really fine like almost like rice and then you put it in a big bowl and then you pour boiling water from a kettle into the broccoli bowl and you leave it for two minutes then you strain it so you drain all the water out and you plate it on some Greek yogurt and some harissa, and you put the broccoli on. 
backwards broccoli super good veggie starter it's my new obsession oh my and in goodness. the book i have all the so many examples of these easy, easy things you can do so it's not we're not talking like complicated like 15 ingredients one hour stuff no 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 we're talking like minutes yeah simplicity yeah. we need that we, we need do. that so the final one of these really important kind of glucose management hacks and this one just makes so much sense and it's growing in popularity now but this is like you're putting the icing on the metaphoric cake with this one which is to move after eating talk about why that's important so your muscles need energy when they're contracting and the more they're contracting the more they're going to need energy and the first place they look for that energy is in free-flowing glucose in your body and so in this hack we just use that to our advantage the concept is after one of your meals during the day use your muscles for 10 minutes now this can be as easy as walking for 10 minutes as easy as the now famous calf push-up you know this guy the soleus muscle in your calf is really good at soaking up glucose try it john go like this so just there you go so sitting you just in the chair we just push-up. if you're just if you're listening to the audio version even sitting in the chair yeah and doing just doing calf some calf raises, raises exactly toes on the ground and so this activates your soleus muscle in your get calf. those calves moving yeah exactly <laughs> so it can be that it can be you know cleaning your apartment, walking your dog, doing a dance video, ice skating, like, I don't know, you can go to the gym, whatever you want. If you do this, your muscles will soak up some of the glucose from the meal you just had. So it will reduce the spike of that meal without you needing to change. Again, very important. You don't need to change what you're eating. You just add these and you see a big impact on your energy levels, your cravings, inflammation, etc. So that's week four. And by the end of week four, you're now a glucose god, glucose goddess, non-binary deity, like whatever. And you're ready. You're on the fast track to steady glucose levels. And what I love the most about this book is that I ran a study, well, a pilot experiment, no control group, just a pilot experiment on 2,700 people in October 2022 as I was writing it. It was like a secret experiment. And so 2,700 people went through the four-week method just for doing savory breakfast, vinegar, veggie starter movement, and the results have been incredible you know by just adding these hacks we have like 90 percent of people reduce their cravings 70 percent of people have more energy 40 percent of people improve their diabetes numbers 40 percent of people improve their hormonal health like the stats are fantastic and it's really approachable and easy to start yeah oh my goodness this is so awesome so can you let everybody know where they can follow you where they could pick up a copy of the book yes. and just get more into your universe so the HQ for all things Glucose Goddess are on my Instagram at Glucose Goddess. My new book is called The Glucose Goddess Method. It's out May 2nd. And we're all starting the four week method on May 22nd. So if you want to join us, that'll be really fun. All you need to do is pre order the book and come to my Instagram while starting then i'm really excited hey if you like this video make sure to check out this video right here not only are we damaging our gut bacteria by eating horrible foods with high sugar and preservatives emulsifiers etc we're also putting them in a dark place for over 24 hours where they don't know what night and day is and they're dying off that way